This is the hands-on computer exhibit at the Exploratorium, a science museum here in San Francisco. And one of the most interesting things about this exhibit is the kids who come here, because there are as many girls as there are boys. The stereotype is that computers are mainly for boys and men. But today, we're going to take a look at women in computing on this edition of the Computer Chronicles. The Computer Chronicles is made possible in part by grants from AFIPS, the American Federation of Information Processing Societies, a nonprofit federation of 11 national societies for computer professionals. AFIPS, leadership and service in computer and information technology. Additional funding is provided by McGraw Hill, publishers of Byte. Byte's detailed technical articles on new hardware, software, and languages cover the latest in microcomputer technology worldwide. Byte, the international standard. Welcome to the Computer Chronicles. I'm Stuart Chaffee, and this is Gary Kildall. Gary, we have up on the computer here an adventure game called Cave Girl Claire that features a young girl as the main figure in the adventure game. And that reminds us right away that, in fact, most adventure games, most computer games are aimed at men. Now, a lot of people thought computers and high tech would be an equalizer among the sexes, but yet most computer engineers, programmers, scientists are, in fact, men. Well, what is your theory as to why there is this gender gap in computers? Well, our industry is really based in general engineering, which is a male-dominated field. But our industry also thrives on talent, innovation, and not on artificial biases and barriers. What's the reality of the situation? I don't know what it is exactly. I do know in my personal experience, my son is a computer nut and my daughter loves horses. Now, I love the, both of those directions, but I can't tell you what I did to influence that. Maybe our experts can. <laughs> I think so. We're going to meet the woman who created this particular piece of software for women. We'll meet several of the top women in the computing field to find out why there are so few women in computers. Now, their numbers may be few, but there are some precocious young women out there in computers, and we're going to begin with a profile of a young female computer whiz. Computers in the classroom are no longer scarce, often introduced to both boys and girls as early as the first grade. But while the sexes are about evenly divided in this elementary school class, the ratio changes in later years. A recent study indicates that first grade girls are just as likely to use computers as boys. But by the sixth grade, boys outnumber girls by two to one. By the time they leave junior high school, boys make up 80% of the group learning to program computers. Educators cite different reasons for the discrepancy, from intimidation and parental pressure to educational software's male-oriented games. But while it may be a simple job to count heads in a classroom, it is harder to keep track of the computer's influence outside of school. Corey Grimm is 16 years old. She's also a graphic artist working at her mother's software company. Since the age of 10, she's used a joystick, a mouse, and an electronic palette to give form to her ideas. To Corey, the computer is not intimidating or alien, but the most natural resource to produce her artwork. She talks about progressing from low to high resolution screens, like a promotion to the next grade. Unlike many artists who only reluctantly traded the tactile sense of a paintbrush for a light pen, Corey began her graphic arts career using the computer as her primary tool. She also has three computers at home, programs in basic, and does her homework on a Macintosh. With the help of teacher workshops, female enrollment in computer classes has expanded recently, and hoping to find a new market, some software vendors continue to develop programs specifically designed for women. But Corey Grimm learned naturally to assimilate computers into her life without worrying about either one. Joining us now is a mother and daughter team of computer scientists. First of all, Thelma Estrin, a professor of computer science at UCLA. And next to her, her daughter, Judy Estrin, the executive vice president at a company she helped found, Bridge Communications, a company involved in local area network technology. Gary? Thelma, you're considered successful by any measure in uh, computer science and engineering. And your daughter is certainly very successful with uh, following your footsteps with uh, advanced degrees in uh, electrical engineering, computer science new company that she's formed, a very successful company. Um, how did you manage to get into a field such as engineering at, at, at the time that you did? Well, you may remember during the Second World War about Rosie the Riveter, the women <laughs> who went into war industries. Well, I 
had the opportunity to work in an engineering lab and replacing the men who were going to fight. And uh, after that, I decided to go back to school and major in engineering. And I, it was at a time when I just went right through and got a PhD in electrical mm -hmm. engineering. And um, you considered uh, pretty rare at that time. Yeah, <laughs> very rare. Uh, most I was married at that time to my husband, who also has a PhD <laughs> in computer engineering. And most of the people thought I was in school either to do his homework or he just had me in school to keep me out of mischief. But nevertheless, we both went on to careers and he had the opportunity to go and work at the Institute for Advanced Study with John von Neumann. Mm -hmm. And I worked there for the summer and then went into another field, biomedical engineering, but then subsequently came back to computer engineering. Have you seen attitudes uh, shift at all during that time? Uh, yes. Tremendously, uh, in the sense that then I was very rare. You, somebody would say, uh, what do you do? And I'd say an electrical engineer. And they'd always say, well, you don't look like an electrical <laughs> engineer. Well, I don't think you find a woman, a woman who says she's a computer scientist today, anybody saying, well, you don't look like a computer scientist. Mm -hmm. So from that point of view, okay. I think. Judy, one thing that uh, uh, people talk about is a role model. Um, how do you, what effect do you think your mother had in terms of your uh, career? I believe very strongly in the uh, impact of role models and is one of the reasons why more and more women are going into computers and engineering because those role models exist. And I think one of the main differences and the things that have helped me be successful has had to do with how I approach uh, my entry into the industry and my moving along in that industry. I never questioned whether or not I should move into a man's profession. I watched my mother do it, and it was a question of why shouldn't I, and let's see anybody stop me, as opposed <laughs> to going out there cautiously. I might add also, though, is when I say that I'm an executive VP of research and development, I still get people who tell me I don't look like an executive <laughs> VP of research and development. So, so maybe not that so much. So it has changed. But uh, if, I, if I said I was an electrical engineer, they, they wouldn't question it. But it is still at the higher levels of management, mm -hmm. I think, okay. that the Judy, attitudes are Judy, changing. we had your mother's perspective on the things that have changed in one generation's mm -hmm. worth. I was wondering what your perspective is on what it's like now compared to what you saw your mother going through when she got into this field. I think they're really t you really have to separate out the individual contributor and the first level managers from upper level, upper level mm -hmm. management. And at the engineer level, it has changed dramatically. And I entered the workforce with, in an industry with young men. And so those younger men were very accepting of me. And I, uh, I'm very happy to say I have had very few obstacles going through my career. It's the reason I've been able to do what I have so quickly. And I think that it, there have been dramatic changes. At the higher levels, uh, someone earlier was mentioning that the women at the top have tended to be at top of companies they have founded. So I do believe that there are still obstacles there, and uh, mainly attitudes of people in terms of upper level management. Is that an attitude uh, about business in general, or is it the computer industry and the no, engineering? I think it's business in general. Mm -hmm. I still think that the computer industry is uh, a lot more advanced in their attitudes than other industries. And it's because it is a young industry driven by younger people who have grown up in a world in which it's more acceptable. But it has not disappeared. And uh, there still are, again, when I introduce myself, people look at me. Um, and uh, it takes a couple minutes for them to believe that it's really true. So. Thelma, you teach computer science at UCLA. And I'd, I'd be interested in what you see in the, the differences in your male and female students, if any. Well, that is, I really teach at the graduate level. And uh, I, well, uh, talking about UCLA, there's one overwhelming difference that you see that transcends male-female, which is the uh, large portion of Asian Americans that are in the school. And interestingly enough, among that new community, you see almost as many women in engineering and, uh, and in computer science as you do, this is both graduate and undergraduate, um, as you do, uh, well, as many women mm -hmm. as you see men. Now, more when, so than among the American yes, students. Yes, more so than among the American students. Yeah. And among the American graduate students, you still see uh, a smaller percentage. You see, you see about 15, 10 to 15% women, while at undergraduate level, it's about 20% women. Okay, Thelma and Judy, thank you. Now, in just a minute, we're going to meet a woman who creates software for women, and we'll meet a woman who heads up a woman's computer project at UC Berkeley, so stay with us.
Joining us now is Elizabeth Stott, co-founder of Rhiannon Software, creators of software for girls. And next to Elizabeth is Kay Gilliland, director of the Equals in Computer Technology program at the Lawrence Hall of Science at UC Berkeley. Elizabeth, uh, Judy was telling us when she grew up in her home, she felt like it was okay to work with computers. Now, do you feel like the software that's out there for the home right now makes a young girl feel like it's not okay? to work with computers? Most of it does. The artwork, the content, the way that the games are played, they all say, hey, this is a boy thing. The advertising, the whole industry has said this is pretty much a male machine. Um, I agreed with what Judy said. It's like cars were in the 1920s. You know, a woman wasn't caught dead driving a car then. So we have this tremendous psychological barrier to overcome with girls. Mm -hmm. And when you talk about role models, that's one a big way that we've addressed it is by very appealing, realistic, spunky, fun, energetic kind of girl characters that are having these neat adventures. That will appeal to girls. They'll say, hey, I'd like to do that. It's not like being a robot or something like that. As long as that's acceptable among the peer group, then, right. then it's okay. What sort of things have you uh, done with, with your software that really is, say, oriented toward, uh, well, not necessarily, say, little boy oriented? Well, they're, they're oriented toward girls in several ways. The characters is one way. The style of the graphics is another way. Our graphics draw at a rate that the eye can follow, which is very appealing. Uh, we tend to find that people lean into the computer when they first see our graphics, rather than leaning away from the computer like they typically do with other software. Can you show us an example? Of sure, that? yeah. We had such a good response from our adventure stories for 7 to 12 year olds that we designed something for 4 to 8 year olds which is, does not involve reading. So with this program, Kristen and Sarah are two new little friends that are uh, for a pre-reader group and they have a different sort of adventures where you use three keys on the computer but you don't have to type or you don't have to read. Now this is the menu that Sarah would have. It shows a bunch of different activities that she could choose. She can uh, put pictures in top, middle, bottom order. She can choose in this one you have weather conditions and they can choose clothes to wear certain days. You can tell nature stories. You can figure out what goes on a calendar and you can put little stories in first, middle, last order. Now this all goes along with the elementary school curriculum and the things that are being taught there. Now here's some of the appeal of the graphics. You know, kids love that and they identify with riding bikes at this age, of course. So Sarah and her friends are always zooming around on bikes. Um, this so is, the idea um, basically is that as a child really gets into this, this quote, game, the computer is just kind of an artifact that's there and then, oh, by the way, it's okay to work with computers because uh, this right. happens to be a way that you can play the game. So, they yeah. identify with what's going on. They make it real. They take it into their own real life. We've built these games around children. We haven't said, let's match children to the computers. We're saying, let's make a computer game that's going to match the interests of the children. So the animations are cute and the clothes, well, for example, if a kid wants to choose a bathing suit to wear in the snow, they can, and they do, and they giggle a lot. Uh, Grown-ups might think that the right answer is the mittens and the boots, but kids like to try different things. So we encourage them to experiment and have a lot of fun and just find out what the computer can do. Do you, do you ever have boys playing with this software? You know, the extraordinary thing is that you have this girl picture on the cover, you say it's for girls, and boys will say, aha, a new computer game, let me try it, <laughs> because it is such a male-identified machine. Whereas girls will say, oh, I didn't know they had anything for girls and then they'll try it and then what happens is that after they've used our software they'll go on to other kinds of software and that's really the point to crash the barrier so they can go on to other kinds of things. Okay what is your uh, feeling about this uh, you know, uh, introducing let's say computers into this? Uh, oh I think it's very important that we use whatever entry point that we have in order to make sure that girls have this experience and uh, many of the things that Rhiannon has done are used in the home, and this helps tremendously. However, um, it's also true that in the schools, something must be done. Many parents really don't have the same uh, feelings of awareness of this. So that uh, one of the interesting things that happened at the Lawrence Hall of Science recently, uh, we were watching a little group of youngsters, preschoolers, using computers. They were all boys, 12 of them. And a mother was standing there watching the kids. And I said, do you have a son in that class? Oh, yes, he's that one over there. And I said, does he like it? Oh, yes, he likes it. Of course, he might rather be out playing. But, uh, but yes, he likes it. I said, do you have a daughter? Oh, yes, she's older. And is she interested in computers, too? Oh, we never thought about it for her. You know, and this is a, an intelligent, ordinarily aware person, but our whole society says to us, 
computers are for boys. And so it's up to mm -hmm. our educational system to make sure that we introduce the things it in, is. A, in a way that does not have that orientation toward one uh, one child. Yeah. Okay, now, now your program is called Equals at the Lawrence Hall of Science, and, and I saw some startling numbers. I think you call them startling statistics, <laughs> which shows why equals is probably a good word. I think 7% of home computer users are women, 5% of the subscribers to Byte are women, 2% of PC buyers are women. Why do you think that is? I'm not sure that I can explain all, explain all the various reasons why that is. I mean, our culture says it to girls when they're very young. Uh, you open the magazines and you find pictures of men. You open that uh, um, manual for, for the um, uh, Macintosh and every entry picture is of a male. And so there are many, many reasons why. But I think what we have to do, accept is we need to do something about it. If, if uh, awareness is a very important thing, then parents need to be aware teachers need to be aware, and in designing the program, actually Equals, uh, directed by Nancy Kreinberg, started in 1977 as a teacher education program in mathematics, and it has developed in a number of ways, family math, uh, Equals in computer technology. Okay, okay, what kind of software do you use in your Equals program? Um, I brought along Gertrude's Secrets, which is from the learning company and is used widely uh, by teachers who are aware of the need for software that is bias-free, that is interesting to girls as well as to boys, and uh, those are some of the things we look for. How does, how does Gertrude's Secret uh, really accomplish that? Um, well, a lack of violence. Mm -hmm. uh, I think that's something that girls have done for us in a way. Many girls do not want the violent games, the war games, and so forth. And so we as teachers have the opportunity to say, hey, I'm not going to have that in my classroom. And uh, so the ideas that are presented are things that both girls and boys enjoy. And the learning outcomes are important for both, particularly important for girls, because um, attribute games such as, as this, spatial relationships have been an area where girls have had particular difficulty. And uh, apparently, they have very different experiences as little mm -hmm. kids. And so if, if girls are school dependent for this learning, it's important for us to have it. OK, there is a, another project aimed at uh, training women in computers. And it's called the Women's Computer Literacy Project in San Francisco. And Wendy Woods has a report on that. All these women have one thing in common. They know nothing about computers. They're at the Women's Computer Literacy Project in San Francisco, an intensive two-day school for women only in which Deborah Brecker teaches the basics in a unique and controversial way. Deborah Brecker has written the Women's Computer Literacy Handbook in which she contends that women learn differently from men. Men, she says, can memorize a set of instructions and then follow them. But women, she says, require an understanding of the concepts and the machines before they can fool around with them. I've been looking in research, actually, to see, you know, is that true? Am I the only person that notices these things? And what I saw is in game theory, what they point out is that boys learn rule games really young, right? Girls are doing process games. They're playing dolls. They're not rules, right? And so it's, I, I think that that patterning, that early childhood patterning, leads in gender into gender differences about how styles of learning. So what the women get are analogies. Brecker compares a buffer to a filling bathtub, RAM memory to mailboxes. Because the class is all women, there's a certain um, common background that I can assume. Everybody knows how to cook, right? They may not you know, enjoy cooking or be gourmet cooks, but they all understand what a recipe is, they understand what ingredients are. So if they understand what ingredients are, then they know what data is, because the data is the ingredients for a computer recipe. 3,500 women ranging in age from their teens to their 70s have gone through this course, which is the only one of its kind in the country. The proof that Brecker's teaching method works is in hundreds of letters that she gets from students. Many of them say, I learned all I needed to know, which is the highest compliment. For the Computer Chronicles, I'm Wendy Woods. You know, Stuart, maybe Byte Magazine ought to run those classes to get that 5% on up their way. So. <laughs> That's a good idea. Gary, we have two people joining us now, and I'd like to introduce Adele Goldberg, who is the manager of the System Concepts Lab at Xerox Park. Adele is also president of ACM, the Technical and Scientific Computer Society. And next to Adele is Jan Lewis, formerly with Microsoft and Infocorp, among others, and now president of the Palo Alto Research Group.
Adele, um, well, this is actually a question for both of you. I'll start with Adele. Uh, in your roles in the computer industry and in the research work you've done, you have to predict sort of what's happening, where the markets are going to be, things of that sort. Do you see a market, a software market, say, for women specifically, or is that just so general that the word process is a word process, a spreadsheet is a spreadsheet? Well, two answers to your question. First, I don't spend my time predicting the market so much <laughs> as predicting the future and trying mm -hmm. to come up with innovative new ideas that will change the marketplace. Okay. Secondly, I don't distinguish between men and women. I think they're people, and I think the previous segment uh, discussing the computer examples, you kept talking about the child and exciting the child. I'm out to excite children and adults in the software that we present. Mm -hmm. now, Jan, what was your experience? I mean, you've come a long way as a woman in this business. I mean, did you have hurdles? Did you have problems? Uh, what was the experience you had? You know, the interesting thing is there probably were hurdles and problems. I don't think I realized it until probably about five years ago. When I got out of college, the first thing I wanted to do was be a programmer because that was a good field for women, and I never thought of it in terms of discrimination. <clears throat> in 1974, I went into sales for informatics. I was one I was the first female of a hundred person sales force and I really was in a fishbowl. At this point a typical high tech sales force will be about 50-50. At that point, I still hadn't thought in terms of discrimination. Um, as you start getting toward the top, you start realizing that you really have more opportunities if you go off and you start your own company and you start your own thing. At least this is what I realized. And you it don't. Seems to be a sort of a recurring theme that uh, that the, the upper levels of the management of the company are difficult to penetrate. Then. I think there are exceptions, but if you look at the examples that are out there, by and large, the really upper levels have, in fact, started their own companies, and. Um, this is really uh, the direction I've gone in, and at this point, I feel um, no problems whatsoever in anybody I deal with in terms of suppliers, in terms of clients, in terms of employees or prospective employees. And I think what I've really done, the tack I've taken, is I have just simply ignored what may or may not have been the obstacles and gone for being the best in anything I do and um, going in that direction. Adele, is there some concern that, that girls, uh, young girls who don't get familiar with computers and so on, will be at some disadvantage when they get to be adults and get into the professional world? I mean, it might not have mattered whether you played with model airplanes, but it may matter if you didn't play with computers. I, th I think that is true of not just girls and boys as well now. Um, it's like never having a pencil and paper in your hand and expecting to get a job when you're an adult. Um, it's becoming more and more imperative to at least have an understanding of what computers are about and how you can use them. Uh, one of the things that have been talked about here today has been the importance of role models. I want to emphasize the importance of also having some jobs related to what you're interested in and getting some experience. I don't think we would hire any longer anyone who hasn't had some computing experience and done some real work in the computing field even though they just graduated from school. Mm -hmm. You expect them to know and have experience using the tool if not doing the science about the tool. Now suppose you are a young girl, like we talked about Gary's daughter before. I mean, it's just I don't like computers. I'm, I'd rather have horses or paint or something. I mean, should, is that a concern of a parent because of what you say? There are days when I don't like computers, and I'd rather have horses and paint for a while. <laughs> I don't think it should be a concern. I think that different people are going to be interested in different things. I have two daughters. I do not have computers in the house for them to play with. Right now I have pianos and art supplies and other people. And I just assume that as they grow up, they develop their particular interests. I do expect them in school to have some computer experience, and I will give them some as well so they do you understand. Do you, do you both see, do you see a positive trend here? That is, is it, a, are we working in the right direction now? That, that more and more women are being involved in computer technology or not? Absolutely, both in the, the early levels. I think there is a natural inquisitiveness on the part of children, and as long as nothing stands in their way, in other words, as long as a computer is there for them to play with and nobody thinks it's something verboten for them, I think it goes in that direction. Mm -hmm. so, I think also in terms of, of business nowadays, um, I disagree, by the way, with that 2% of purchasers. I see women, the surveys I've done in the Fortune 2000, the number of women who are doing the purchasing is increasing dramatically at this point. So I see a, a great move in the direction of women uh, as well as men simply using computers. I'm sorry we're out of time. Thank you so much. Thank you. We just have enough time to go to our commentator, Paul Schindler, for his closing thoughts. As the father of two girls, ages five and one, the subject of this show has special meaning to me. In my other job as senior West Coast editor of Information Week, I wrote a cover story on women and computing. And frankly, it makes me as mad as hell to see how badly women are underused in the computer business. I think it should make you mad too, whether you're a man or a woman. Let me tell you why. 
If you're a woman, you should be mad because the accident of your birth puts you at a permanent disadvantage in the computer business. Sure, your disadvantage in this field is less than in other fields, but so what? It's still a disadvantage. If you're a man, you should be mad because you're watching a terrible waste of human resources. I hope no one still argues in this day and age that women aren't as smart as men. If they are as smart, they should be half the DP workforce, but they're not. That means, on the face of it, that millions of women who could be the best people in computing are doing something else. That's a shame. Now, I'm not saying hire women because they're women. I'm saying hire the best person for the job, regardless of sex. That's my opinion. I'm Paul Schindler. I'm Susan Chase, sitting in for Stuart Chaffe. In the random access file this week, Franklin Computer Corporation unveiled the first personal computer not made by Apple to be compatible with Apple software. Franklin filed for reorganization under federal bankruptcy laws last year after a lengthy legal battle with Apple over previous alleged copyright infringement. The new Ace 2000 will come in three models, all priced under $1,000, about $600 less than Apple's 2C and 2E models. Franklin says ship will begin this week. Apple Computer continues to improve its own products. Apple will offer a memory upgrade for its 2E that will expand its memory to almost twice that of the IBM PC. Other improvements to be announced this month include a higher capacity floppy disk drive, a color monitor, and software that makes the machine more like the Macintosh. AT&T and Atari are reportedly negotiating an arrangement for Atari to sell some of its ST computers through AT&T. Such an agreement would give Atari a major customer for its new computer, while giving AT&T a low-cost entry into the personal computer market. Officially, both companies declined to confirm the negotiations. Get ready to put away your Lotus 123 spreadsheet program. A new program called Javelin goes beyond the current spreadsheet columns and rows by giving users the ability to look at data in almost a dozen different forms. Javelin allows users to see where data came from, the logic that determined the formula used, and which pieces of data are affected when any variable is altered. The program is designed for IBM PCs with at least 512K of memory and will sell for about $700. And now for more software news, here's Paul. Schindler with his review. You know, getting organized must be difficult for all of us, judging from the number of software packages that promise to help, MaxiThink, for example, or Think Tank. But every time a need becomes clear, someone comes along and builds a better mousetrap, or in this case, a better thought trap. They call Da Vinci a renaissance in thinking. They may be right. Da Vinci is faster, cheaper, and more flexible than any other outline program on the market. It uses color well and includes both a calculator and a calendar. Your outline can contain up to five levels, each of which can contain 99 topics, although there's an overall limit of 255 headings. Each heading can be as long as 60 characters. Each can have 50 lines of text associated with it. This text can then be exported into your word processor. If you change your mind about the order of subjects, reorder them. If you decide to make subtopics into topics and vice versa, you can do that too. This thin book tells you all you need to know about how to run the program. That's how simple it is. Da Vinci from Applied Microsystems, Rosewell, Georgia, costs $60 and offers the best outlining help on the market. It's not copy protected. For the Computer Chronicles, I'm Paul Schindler. That's it for this week's Computer Chronicles. See you next time. The Computer Chronicles is made possible in part by grants from AFIPS, the American Federation of Information Processing Societies, a nonprofit federation of 11 national societies for computer professionals. AFIPS, leadership and service in computer and information technology. Additional funding is provided by McGraw-Hill, publishers of Byte. Byte's detailed technical articles on new hardware, software, and languages cover the latest in microcomputer technology worldwide. Byte, the international standard.